so thank you, everybody. Just great, just great, insightful stuff. Um, but I am, uh, in the words of my friend Tanya, going to call shenanigans. There's, I want to start first with this cognitive, cognitive dissonance that I'm feeling. Brian, you start with the quote, funding this is an absolute mandate. And at least half of the audience went into an involuntary nod. Uh, and then Brock shows his first slides showing the real NIH dollars going down and down and down. Five years ago at RMF, the Regenerative Medicine Foundation, when they were doing their independent conferences, uh, we saw Newt Gingrich and G Dick Gephardt on stage together, hand in hand, which that might not be as hard to do as getting current political candidates together on stage and agreeing on something. But uh, I gotta imagine that's pretty hard. And they got up and said, yeah, we've gotta fund this stuff, we've gotta fund more transformative approaches to cures for age-related diseases. We have to do this as a mandate. It's a mandate for both parties, it's a mandate for America, it's a mandate for the world. What the heck is going on? Why is it going plummeting what is it going to take for them to hear that clarion call? And is there some sort of threshold of success or threshold of, of, of efficacy or a threshold of technologies that they're waiting for in order to get really motivated about this? You're looking at me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think that um, there's been a lot of effort uh, on the sort of uh, public side to try to get people interested and, and you know I've met with congressmen a lot of people have done that uh, it's with the budgets where they've been federally you know the, the argument has been we just can't increase the pie and so then if you're talking about aging research you're trying to redirect the, the, the slices that are already there so that you get a bigger slice and given the, in, the entrenchment of the way that NIH operates that's very difficult to do um, there has been, as you know, a geroscience initiative within the National Institute of Aging to try to get other institutes in NIH to, to recognize that aging is their biggest risk factor and try to do collaborative funding. Uh, that had a lot of traction, especially when it was everybody meeting and talking about things. Uh, now we're at the phase where they're, how do you find some funding to get people to do that? And it's slow, but maybe it'll gain some strength. So I think there's two different problems. There's the funding level of the NIH in general and getting people excited uh, about supporting science again, which is, I think, lagged. Uh, and then there's also the challenge specific to aging, which is how do, you, how do you get this message across that this is a huge problem? Uh, I, I also think that there's been an anti-intellectual movement in the United States driven partly politically so that uh, you know, we're, and I think that affects science in the long term. You elect people that are, don't, don't value the, uh, um, the research and technology and education, and then you ask them to fund things like the NIH, it gets to be difficult. Uh, Deborah, from, a, from, from the perspective of somebody representing an organization formed around one disease, is, is it clearer what the pathway is to sort of get critical mass in the, in the public to recognize that? Is there a certain amount of recognition you can reach after which you can say, now we're there, we have, we have awareness, we, or is it just a continuing battle? Uh, it's a battle. It's absolutely a battle. So we, we personally have not gone to the government for, for funding. Um, I think with one of the new projects that we're working on, we will probably write our first NIH grants and really looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> so, oh, you know, you touched on a really important part of this, and it's awareness. I mean, all of these rare diseases, SMA, Duchenne, you know, people haven't heard of them until you're personally affected by them. Um, and then you might have also noticed, working with the SMA organization, that there's a whole bunch of organizations and so there's a lot of it's it's diffused a lot within within even a small rare disease yeah. population and it's diffused even more amongst just a ton of diseases or a ton of um, organizations because it's very easy to create a web page get a 501c status and all of a sudden you're in business you know raising yeah. money and um it's it's not the most efficient way but you know you can't, I mean, I would never try and tell somebody don't do that either. So um, I think awareness is really, really important. Our, um, I think in, in Duchenne specifically, we've been so close to having approved drugs. We've had three drugs before the FDA, 
and the FDA has basically just squished everything. I mean, we've gotten a, re, you know, a, a CRL a refused to file, and they're just dragging their heels on making a decision on the other one. And I think what, you know, if, if one of these would get approved, I think it would create a groundswell that would, would create, um, I think, a lot more awareness, a lot of attention, and a lot more investment coming into the space. I mean, if, if, if a biotech company or a pharma company thinks that they're going to be dealing with the FDA right now in its present form, it's, it's not very uh, much of an incentive. Yeah. You know, I, I want to follow up on that just for a second, because, and I want to get much more into what you're doing in terms of these, the, the venture philanthropy approach, but just in a minute. And, but as an aside before that, um, I recently heard a presentation by uh, Hugh Hempel, who's a fellow whose kids you. have Neiman Pick disorder. All right, so he represents Addie and Cassie Foundation. They're, they're twin girls. And he said that, uh, I think this was at Faster Cures a year and a half ago, and he said that uh, while it was nonprofit and they were working with the funding organizations and the FDA and the review boards of the different hospitals and the like, it was wonderful. Everybody was doing everything they could to make this happen. But he realized this, and a part, of the, part of his strategy was this venture philanthropy approach, figure out a way for the private corporations to take over. And he said as soon as he did that, as soon as he tried to privatize, whether it was through him or somebody else, whether he had stock or didn't, the whole era of cooperation just broke down and it became a very commercial question with a very reticent FDA, a very reticent um, application procedure and all the steps he was taking. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't speak to that. I just think that um, I, I don't have that experience. So I'm, you don't? No. Good. Um, uh, uh, Brock, turning to your slides for a second, um, and before we get to, again to the issue of the, the broader issues yeah. of financing and the like, uh, your slides ta have some great detail and data about what's happening in biopharma as a whole. Uh, but between you and Brian, maybe, do we... You know, one of the problems we have as an organization is it's hard to figure out exactly what's happening there. I can't say how much other funding is happening in rejuvenation. Strictly in damage repair is sort of a subset of a subset of a subset from the NIH's point of view. And they're not really publishing reports that call that a field right now. So that might raise a pretty important question in biopharma when we, it's great to understand the meta trends. Is the investment going up, down? Are there still exit strategies for the investors? But really the bigger question, are we still investing in sick care rather than health care, kind of remains unanswered in that, doesn't it? Or, or are we able to parse the data on which pieces of that are really transformative and what's really happening there? Wow. Well, uh, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, a couple of things are happening, and uh, to come back to the, uh, the earlier question about the NIH, and I think it's partly related to it, is one of the problems when you have less government money being spent, it's being spent more conservatively. So what happens not only is the absolute money going down, down to that, you know, 9% pay line, whatever, but the, the projects that are funded are not, more likely not to be the transformative ones that you're interested in. They're likely to be the safer ones that people know will work. Because as the you know, study groups get together and say, why should we fund this versus that? Um, they say, well, we know this will be successful, or, this, or you know, do you have the data? And the transformative, a lot of the, you know, the big picture, sort of aggress, you know, early stage science stuff, we don't know that it's going to work. Right? So you have to be willing to take that bet. And that's, I think, a key role that government can play. The private sector can because they have, uh, particularly the, the, by private sector, I mean you know, the public companies in that have shareholders to report to, right? So for example, one of the problems with partnering with big pharma companies is they'll shut down different groups, right? So for example, you know, we've done some uh, GSK was a partner of ours for several years. They had a neuro group that they just said, okay, the neuro group doesn't exist anymore. Um, and even though we're doing, you know, good, re luckily they kept the project going through some other, you know, mechanisms and when now we're doing clinical trial and ALS as a result, but they literally sh shut it down. Um, and so if you want to have the foundation of um, 
and I'm just using that as an example, but it's true in all companies. But so, so if you want to be able to fund the basic work that is going to you know, provide the platform for sort of having you know, huge impact with where you can study whether it's big issues like mitochondrial damage or whether it's you know, senescence or you know, what sort of fundamental questions, you can't have that be at risk of going in two years because you're not going to have your answer in two years, right? Um, so we need a balance. We need the research that'll be ready to fund the open-ended, curiosity-driven question, say, what happens if, right? Then we need the more applied stuff. And, um, and, you also, and then you also need the people that don't have a motivation to make money at the end of the deal. So for example, there was um, uh, a group in Montreal that just got started where they say, we're not gonna patent any of the findings coming out of our work. It's gonna be very early stage. We're just gonna make it available to everyone. Sort of like open source software. Right. We're gonna make it av av available to anyone, have at it. Um, and then there are variations on the theme. For example, there's a, a guy who is a cancer researcher at the Dana-Farber in Boston who's now uh, runs uh, Novartis's uh, research group. Um, and he uh, had a drug discovery group at the Farber, and he published you know, his molecules, and then in a way that made it available to the field, and he stimulated work around the world, and people using and modeling many different disease conditions, applications that he had never even dreamed of. And as a result, have a better, but he was in a nonprofit, and sort of had you know, the freedom to do that. And then they kept, you know, and then they designed some structure and they actually did have some IP and they built a company around part of it. So he could do the, that sort of, you know, disseminate the knowledge yet also create economic value at the same right. time. So uh, it requires a mix. Just a couple notes to that. You know, I think that when it comes to NIH, I agree they fund way too conservative grants. And at one point I got an argument, I was chair of a study section for a while, and I got an argument saying, you know, really we should have a 10 or 15% failure rate. Uh, that the grants that got funded that didn't accomplish, the, did, the hypothesis was wrong. Because that's the only way we can ensure that we're hitting those rare novel hypotheses that are right, that are really transformative. And that's, that's really, it succeeded in one way. It succeeded in getting me invited to a lot less study sections, which I'm <laughs> happy about. Uh, but, it, but it was like <laughs> taken as total like craziness. And then I also, from the pharma perspective, I also agree, it's that these large pharma companies are, have attention deficit disorder. I mean, it, there's one of the big ones that's been thinking about aging and for the last few years, and every time I ask somebody, there are changes. You know, there's, you know, the first we're gonna put 20 people on aging, and then three months later we change the chief scientific officer, we don't care about aging. And then six months later we change the CEO, and now we're re-emphasizing aging, but in a different way. And, and I feel like there's, on their R&D side, there's, they, there's not a lot of staying power for in a lot of these programs, and I, I think that's one of the things that's hurting the pharma R&D as well. I mean, for example, in, in, in our seed grant program that I mentioned, now we don't do this at scale. I mean, these are 10 projects a year that get the equivalent of literally 100,000 per project. Um, so they're you know, early stage experiments. We track them over the year, and on average, have about 50% of them go on to get further funding. So in fact, we had the conversation, say, were we being too conservative? In fact, you know, was that too high a success rate? Should we be taking even riskier projects? Um, but on the other hand, we can't do that at scale. So the question is, how do you do that sort of thing yeah, at scale? It needs to be done. Uh, before I open it up into questions, I want to uh, talk about venture philanthropy for a minute. But uh, before I do that, I want to reiterate that Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Reeve have uh, just proposed demonstrated failure rates as a measure of success. And I think that's a fascinating <laughs> idea. I also want to point out to follow up on Brock's uh, conversation there that um, uh, last year's presentation by Chaz Bountra is one of the best examples I've seen of an open drug discovery network focusing in the Alzheimer's arena, and he's been hugely successful with that. His groups have been publishing a paper every four days, I think, a scientific paper every four days, not a note or a comment, a scientific paper every four days based on getting more and more companies, investors, and basic researchers to invest in uh, promulgating their failures as well as their successes. So failures are obviously a, a, an important part of what's going on here as well as success. Um, but to, to move on to the venture philanthropy, and I, I know um, from my limited interaction with social journals and the nonprofit journals that there's a lot of definitions to this term. 
So I want to talk about the aspect of uh, using philanthropic money to then create more funding stream out of the mission-oriented work of what you're doing. And start with you, Deborah, but ask everybody there, is this the future of where we're going? Do we need to see more of this interaction? Is this where the, the real resources is going to come from? And I'll preface that by saying that I spent a decade in universities and, and the, the, throughout the 90s, the whole impetus of tech transfer efforts, which were burgeoning in every university everywhere, uh, was to try to bring up that industrial funding rate at universities. But, you know, the lowest of them were at around 7%, and the highest of them were at around 12%, and that was just where you were. Uh, so is it changing now? Is that the wave of the future? Is that where the resources will come from? Right. So, I mean, I'm probably biased, but, um, you know, again, coming from a very small disease population where, I mean, if every single family afflicted with Duchenne was to dedicate a ton of their time to helping raise money, it'd be a drop in a bucket of what we really needed to fund the research. And so the numbers, I mean, it was when we funded Procens, our initial investment was 1.3 million, and that was a preclinical study. Um, you know, there's a big difference between a preclinical study and exponentially the cost to go into a clinical study, even a phase one. And so all of a sudden you're in a different game. And so just doing, you know, your, your galas and marathon runs and everything isn't going to fund the type of research we need to get into. And I feel very strongly that, that the disease groups have um, a position in venture philanthropy that's really important because I, I think what distinguishes us, and it's very, very important to us, when we invest in a company or a project, the science comes first. I mean, you know, I'm not thinking about the return, I'm not thinking about the money, I'm not thinking about anything. You know, we have um, one of our, our chief scientific officer is, you know, 30 years in drug development experience, um, worked for all the big pharmas. We have, you know, um, one of our advisors or one of our employees is, you know, came out of, you know, he's an MD trained, but he's been more recently at um, a venture capital firm. And so he is, his job was to vet all these things that came to him. And so we've got like really high level of expertise. So the science always comes first. And so I think that's really important because I'm not thinking about an exit, you know. And I think, but it, it turns out that we're going to be more successful because of that. Right. And so I think that, I think it is important and I would love to see all the, the nonprofits adopt this because um, I think investors will be more aware of it and I think that the companies and the scientists are going to have to be more accepting of it also um, because everybody would like to have non-dilutive funding and, um, <laughs> and so it, it makes it really hard when we're going in and we you know, expect to have equity or royalty or whatever, whatever the arrangement is and we're really flexible about it. Um, and if another nonprofit goes in and says, you know, we'll just give you the money, you know, it puts us in kind of a difficult situation. But the point is, is I think, you know, again, I'm being biased, we know more what to do with the project because we have the expertise to partner with that company and actually help them develop the drug versus, you know, a nonprofit who is very much into patient advocacy and, and you know, that. So it's, I, I would love to see the whole, whole nonprofit arena adopt this. Yeah. Why not? If I can make one comment on that. And I will, but, but before I turn to you, I'll point out also that, that Joyce Brinton and Lita Nelson, technology transfer directors at Harvard and MIT in the 80s, basically created technology transfer strategies. So, so what's your take on that? Which may be a bad, well, we'll come to whether yeah, tech okay. transfer is a good thing or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but one example about the venture philanthropy, particularly the, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation example with Kaleidico, right? Um, because, as you, many of you know, they you know, funded this work in um, the cystic fibrosis agent that then ultimately Vertex ended up commercializing. And the CFF um, sold off their, re their uh, royalty stream to Royalty Pharma uh, for three plus billion dollars. Now, every foundation would love to have that example, but what, what people forget is CFF had, had to fund that project for over 15 years. Um, Vertex almost, you know, Vertex got it because they, it was part of a company that they acquired. They almost killed the project a few times. So to have that appetite to do that 
you know, everyone sees that big carrot at the end, but to have the appetite to do that, you have to be willing to fund it along the way and know there are going to be ups and downs and it's a rocky road. Which is where right? a lot of the VCs will not stick it And the VCs won't go there, like yeah. a venture capital got, wouldn't have done that. They have right? their window and that's it. Yeah. And, and a it's lot a of huge people product. forget that, that Bob Bell had been shepherding that CFF um, yeah. the profile in interaction with industry for, God, I don't know, I think since I was watching Yogi Bear in elementary school. I, I, I don't remember a time when he was not the head of that organization. Yeah, and literally funding that project was, a, you guys probably know better they've than I, but it was at least 15 years. They've done a fantastic you know. job in just about everything they do. I mean, I, I hold them up with very high esteem in terms of their whole organization. Brian, what's your perspective? You've, your organization as a whole has put more effort into tech transfer and more industrial yeah. liaison. I mean, I, I think we've tried to maintain a balance. I think we feel like that... Um, we certainly want to be as active as possible in the translational space, and we've um, been successful in starting seven companies and getting them funded at various levels. Um, many of them are still nascent. I'm sure some of them won't make it, but I think some will, and it's allowing us to really do more uh, development around trying to develop interventions in this, in this space. But you know, I think at the same time, there's a lot of basic science that needs to be done, and basic science is really being squeezed right now. Uh, it's being squeezed by the NIH, and uh, you know, and certainly foundations fill some of those gaps that are important in the, in the American Federation for Aging Research, Glenn Foundation, Ellison Foundation, all those things in the aging field have funded mostly basic science and aging. And it's, if we didn't have that, we, there's a lot we wouldn't know right now. So it's it's trying to achieve a balance, and particularly when you have an institute where you you got to you want to expand the basic science and also translate at the same time. So when people come to us and they have, you know, we tr we try to, to to excite them in 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 ways that either get them to support the basic science through peer philanthropy, or if if they want to go down the development route, we're happy to do that too, and they become investors in our companies. So. Great. Uh, listen, I, I definitely want to make sure we get time for some open questions. I know this is an unusual kind of presentation, so I'm sure there'll be a bunch. <clears throat> Do I sit? Can I sit? Um, this is addressed to Brian. It's just a comment. Uh, I want to defend American medicine. Uh, you pointed out Japan is the head of the United States in uh, life expectancy. I'm a practicing physician from La Jolla, California. I've been dedicated to gerontology since age 17. I strongly expect that if you would get the statistics on the top life expectancies of the top uh, people in the United States compared to Japan, you would find that America would be ahead of all of the rest, of them and all the rest of the world, from what I've seen among my patients and what I've seen around wherever I've gone. It's, it's a, an interesting question around uh, the top percent, but I think what that reflects to me is that those people are getting access to the kinds of health care that are more holistic, that's keeping them healthy and letting them live longer, that we should be providing to everybody. So even if that's true, it's still an indictment of our health care system in a broad way. It just says we know what to do at the top. Hey, this is James Pyre from uh, Apollo Ventures. I kind of wanted to address a little bit Mike's cognitive dissonance point and um, defend the American pharmaco industry a little bit from uh, the way that we as, as entrepreneurs and as researchers and philanthropists are kind of at the lowest level of the, the chain on basic research. And there's this trickle down that happens, right, from pharma companies and regulators, but there's one black spot that Brock mentioned in his uh, presentation right at the end, which is the reimbursement angle, where pharma companies have a master too, and it's the DRG codes of Medicare, right? These disease-related groups that determine whether or not a drug will be profitable for a given, ind a given indication. And so when we look at pharma companies like Novartis that ha have expressed an interest in aging research, and GSK who bought Sertris, but seem a little waffly, I think that we can explain away a lot of that when we realize that there's no DRG for aging, right? And unless you can go into a different indication first and then 
shift your drug into something that we call like the multi-morbidity indication. Um, pharma companies will look at this and every time their new review cycle comes up, they'll be plotting how well they think this drug will do against the indications it can be approved for and with aging, there's just not a lot there yet. I, I, I'm going to take a first shot since it was my comment that, that provoked the question and, and say I agree wholeheartedly and uh, that, that a big part of that question is why we're thinking more strongly about what we can do to create alliances in this world and to actually get people to better self-identify as rejuvenation biotechnologists. It's not a just, just about teaching our interns to say, I don't want I, I to just cure heart disease. I want to understand the biological underpinnings of what's causing it and define myself that way. It's also about the fact that it's not, even before the re reimbursement question, you have the regulatory question. How do you put something in front of the FDA right now? That's an anti-aging approach. You, if, you're gonna, if you fix one kind of damage where a disease may have three, four, five, six, or seven, it's not gonna have any impact. It can be perfectly usable and efficient and effective, and you won't be able to design a phase three clinical trial with it. And I suspect that this may have been the historical trouble that Eli Lilly had with solizumab in part. It may have been very effective at what it was trying to do, but the only label they could try to clinically approve it for was something that was too late for what it was trying to do. And so we may have to have more, uh, more uh, uh, adaptive licensing approaches. We may have to have more phase four licensing review approaches. We may have to have uh, just more understanding and dialogue in the community of what you can do to establish a different approach in the clinic to understanding what's going on there. Sorry, let, but let's let Deborah just. Respond. No, just real quickly. I think one one great thing about collaboration, you know, across diseases is, for example, the rare disease. You know, we have the orphan drug designation, and so a lot of these indications for aging, um, you know, if there is some synergy between, if a company can direct some of their their um, research at least to some of the rare diseases that would spill over into aging, at least they get the benefit of the the orphan drug designation. I think there's going to be a lot of cross over between these rare diseases and aging. I think that's something that's emerging from the research. You mentioned it's that with muscular drug. dystrophy. But I, I suspect that's going to be a, a growing area of investigation. Uh, hi, Keith Camito from Lifespan.io here. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, if you guys have thought of your organizations allocating significant resources specifically to PR initiatives, like uh, what the early cancer advocates did with the Jimmy Fund or, or taking out a full news page uh, spread, kind of calling out President Nixon and, and how effective that was. That's what we're trying to do with the crowdfunding and partnering with YouTube celebrities to really engage and inform millions of people. And now I understand you might want to you know, spend the money on the research now and not this stuff, but is there a potential there, do you think, for maybe you know, a 10x return uh, on that investment of trying to really use the narrative strong points that we have of the economic collapse that's waiting for us and the humanitarian? I think there's a way to kind of spin that, and now might be the time to do that. So just curious about what your thoughts are. I mean, I agree with you, and certainly we do put effort into marketing and PR, but you know, in a tight budget era where the NIH is constricting our money, it's, it, it's a challenge to devote the resources that are really needed to accomplish the goals. And, and uh, I think that that kind of crowdfunding approach, we, we've looked into that in the past. We're very interested in, in those kinds of things. And I think everybody's struggling to find the right strategy, particularly with respect to aging. You know, it, it still strikes me as odd that it's hard to raise money around aging with seven billion people doing it. Uh, but it is, and, and so we don't have that messaging right, and, and I still think we're struggling to find the right avenue and the right message to get that done. That's a great comment. Time. All Sorry. Right. <laughs> all right. Rob, well, I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you all for the, your slides and your talks today. It was really wonderful. And, and Deborah, especially, uh, it was very just great to meet you today. I'm so glad you could join us. And thank you, all three. Thank you.